Good morning everybody. Today I'm doing something very different. I'm doing a bit of a vlog. I don't really do very many of these. I tried them in the early days of the channel, then I kind of gave up. But in honour of today's topic, I thought I would try my hand at a little bit of the old classic YouTube vloggy stuff. Now, it might look quite simple, but vlogging has a very specific formula you need to follow if you want to do it right. It's not simply a matter of just picking up a camera and just talking to it. That obviously is a part of it, but if you pay careful attention, there's a little bit more that goes into these things. For example, if you want to do a vlog properly, you probably do want to start it in the morning. You want to talk people through your day. You want to make this a bit of a journey. Yes, certainly, if you want to abide by the almighty commandments of the vlog, you don't want to get straight into your topic. Don't begin the video with what the title says. That would be wrong. There are various reasons why you don't want to do that. Some good, some bad. What else do you need with a vlog? Um, Oh yeah, jump cuts. You need jump cuts, they imply a passage of time, they give a video an energy, a more frantic nature, and if you then um, forget your words or anything like that, it helps break things up. No, not break things up, it helps speed things up. That's the one that I'm after. Then of course you need to do a little bit more, you need to talk to the audience about what you're doing. So what am I doing today? Well, I'm going to go and meet another YouTuber, but in order to do that, I need some things. I am currently here in the JM Nerve Center, the house of a thousand caps, and um, one day I'll do a video on some of these. So, what is it that I need to do? Well, I need to grab my stuff. This is a pretty big part of my filming kit. Incidentally, the camera that I'm using today is one that I haven't used before. Uh, it's a new item to the kit. Not probably gonna be as good a quality as the main camera, but if you like what I'm doing, you can hear me clearly, you can see the pictures and everything, do tell me because this could really uh, help create some extra content for me easily. So. If you want to do a proper vlog, you also need to do something with a slightly trick edit, uh, like for example, uh, something very mundane, like putting some cameras in your bag. Only, oh no, my action cameras are already in my bag. How will I do a trick edit now? Oh my god, where did it go? Ah, it's magic. I am also available for kids' parties. And now, for a needlessly dynamic shot, getting them back in. I've been watching a bit of The Evil Dead lately. And then, an action that probably shouldn't even be in the edit at all, but it's taking a little bit too long, you have to speed up. Ready, go! It's tiring moving in fast forward. And now, out the door. Now today is what's known as a challenging day for exposure. Got a choice of cars to take, the F12, or this, a Lexus RX, which I have on loan, and I do need to film with later on. But I'm taking the F12, because I promised today's subject that I was going to bring it. I also have in my hand a little bit of memorabilia that I'm bringing them, because I know they're into cameras. This is an actual, genuine tin of film from the Fifth Born movie. It was rubbish, wasn't it? But I didn't know that when I stole it from the bins. It was legit, I did get given it, so don't worry about that. I'm not handing off stolen merchandise. And, uh, Gonna chuck some stuff in here, then we'll start it. When you're a Ferrari owner, there are certain creature comforts you don't always expect in their cars because I think they just don't see them as a priority and they don't have the time. Uh, things like, for example, being able to open the boot without the alarm going off. On a 599, you can't. On an F12, you can. Look at how much space is in this car. It's one of the reasons I love it so much. So, in goes the tin of film. Rise, Lord Vader. As it happens, I actually have a tin of film from Star Wars Force Awakens also in my study. Uh, yeah, gonna need a tripod. Manfrotto tripod with a Zackler head on it, just in case you're wondering. Cannot forget the sunglasses. Yours for just $29.99 off Amazon. Into the car, it's about 7.30, so I'm sure the neighbors are about to love me. Actually, I'm very lucky with my neighbors. Sport mode, I think, for this time of day, and uh, probably guessed it, if for any other reason than I've probably put it in the title, but the person we're going to see today is one you almost certainly already know. You probably call him Shmi, but to me, I know him as Tim, and that is an important distinction, because the person I want to talk to today is not so much Shmi, I want to introduce you all to the Tim that I know, and I've got a very, very good reason for wanting to do that, more of which after my intro, so cue the funky music. Oh, 
your back. Right, before I tell you more about Tim, we do need to do something that is very, very important that every Ferrari owner has to do on a pretty much daily basis. Ordinarily, I would go to Tesco's, but because of the direction I'm going in, I am forced to pay a visit to Dick Turpin. In good automotive design, the controls that you need most will be placed closest to you. So what control do Ferrari think you're gonna use most? Not the boot lid, petrol flap. I do hate that there's no sort of proper nice aluminium filler flap you have to take off like old Ferraris, but uh, that's not so bad, I guess. So you've already almost certainly made your opinion up about Schmi, and you're more than welcome to said opinion. He wouldn't fight you on it. In fact, he wouldn't take anything really that much from it because as far as he's concerned, you are insulting Schmi, not him, if you go and say something. Incidentally, if you really want to get a good insight into what Tim is actually like, go and watch the Late Break Show's interview with him, with car pervert Johnny Smith. Incidentally, that's a YouTube channel I really, really like and enjoy watching, and today I'm not really gonna try and bother going over too many of the same topics because Johnny already did a brilliant job. I don't think I can better it. But what I can do is tell you what I know about Tim. I've been in automotive YouTube for about six years now, and as a smaller channel, which I suppose I'm kind of getting out of being classed as a smaller channel, still think of myself that way though. But as a really small channel, you know, sort of 10, 15,000 subs or so, it was really, really frustrating. Once you did start going on press events and things like that, you find that quite a few of the traditional magazine types, they, um, they, they really don't like you. They do very much ignore you. They pretend that you're not there or just look down upon you. That's not true of all of them. Some of them have been absolutely lovely, really quite nice people, and I've been very, very glad about that. However, it is pretty disappointing when you bump into someone that is essentially a hero figure of sorts, and they turn out to be not quite as pleasant as you had hoped. This weirdly has also happened a few times with other YouTubers where I've been on events and things. I don't think any of them have ever been sort of like directly really rude to me or anything like that. It's a little bit dramatic. But I have had more than one occasion where they've simply just ignored me. Now I know they're very, very busy people. They have a job to do. It is quite a stressy job. There is always something to be done. But I was on an event a few years ago. I was flying away. It was one of my first sort of international launches. There were a couple of other YouTubers there and they, they had no idea who I was. I spent some time with them and they, they really didn't care. And that, that, that's, that's fine. But Tim, had already found out from the PR guy that I was going to be there. And he sent me a message saying, want to make sure that you feel welcome, any questions or queries you've got, if it works different to anything you're used to already, you know, just no hesitation, come and ask me whatever, you know, and he really made me feel genuinely like I had just as much reason to be there as he did despite being a channel with sort of, you know, a 20th of his fan base. And, and that, that really meant a lot. He didn't have to do that at all. And I know he's been like that with a number of other smaller channels. It's a kindness I try and pay forwards, you know, as I remember what it was like, a, a 5,000 subscriber channel having 200,000 subscriber channels look down upon you and ignore you. So now I'm a 2,000 subscriber channel. If someone comes along with a 5,000 sub channel and it's something I think really is pretty decent and they want to do it as a career, and that's an important distinction, where I can, I do love to try and help others out. And I've made some really, really good friends uh, through it as well. As it happens, today was not my idea. Today was Tim's. He got in touch with me, he said he wanted to do something, and he has given me pretty much his entire day. So the plan is, get there, have a little bit of a chat with him. I've got a topic in mind, and then we're gonna film with each other doing various bits and bobs. That sounds sinister, doesn't it? You know what I mean. You do know what I mean. You do. <clears throat> then I'm going to take one of his cars out for a drive. Now, he's offered me a couple of different ones. The weather is pretty good today, so I think I know which one I want. But that's going to be a separate video. I think this is more than enough of a run-up. So I'm going to turn the camera off now, and the next time I turn it on should be inside the Schmuseum. Oh, let's do a transition, shall we? <gasps> It doesn't work if your hand's cold. <sighs> yeah, did I do that right? Anyway, you've seen it in pictures, I've seen it in pictures, but now I'm here for real. Welcome to the Schmuseum, located inside a hollowed out volcano and accessible exclusively through a series of intricate tunnels underneath London's Paddington Station. 
Anyway, let's show you around. The idea is that most of the time, most of Tim's cars, otherwise known as the Schmiemenbeels, will be here. But I know what it's like trying to run a smaller collection of cars. I have seven, and I don't think they've ever all met. Tim has quite a few more, and as you might imagine, that means that not all are here today. But a significant proportion are. And I talked earlier about wanting to introduce you more to Tim rather than Schmie. So in this video, I'm really just going to ask him one simple thing. Talk to me about cars, specifically the cars that are here today. Because as YouTubers, despite the fact our channels are quite different sizes, we often get a lot of the same things accused of us, asked of us, and so on and so forth. And one of the things many people tend to believe is that we buy cars solely based on their business potential. Cars we think will get lots of views from videos and will therefore make loads of money out of. Of course, neither of us are ignorant of the business side of being YouTubers, because that's how we both earn our money. But being petrol heads, there's a lot more to it than just that. So I'm going to hand you over to the man himself, who hopefully is going to talk you through a little bit of the collection. And if you've enjoyed seeing a slightly different side to Tim, I highly recommend you check out his channel, The Schmuseum, which is aimed at the more sort of general petrol head focused content rather than the necessarily latest and greatest stuff you'd often associate automotive vloggers with. Welcome to the Schmuseum then. So on this side, we have some of the flagship cars. There are a few missing at the moment. On the other side is mostly, let's say, storage. That's the kind of idea. But I've been here in this garage for about nine months or so, just outside of London. An opportunity for me to have some space, to be able to look after the cars, to be able to be a bit away from the center of London where I used to be, and of course, to film my videos and things, but also just have everything in one place, which as a petrol head and car collector has been probably the most special part of this. And while it would be amazing to literally have every car here at once, there are cars on different continents, there are cars at service, there are cars at various events and all sorts of things. And that's part and parcel, I suppose, of the fun of it all. But we're gonna have a run through of the cars here, take you guys through what we've got at the moment. I suppose we'll start with the brightest of them all tucked in at the corner, the Lotus Elise Cup 250 final edition a car that actually belongs to a friend of mine, but he's very kindly allowed me to pick it up, to collect it, to do the running in, to have it, to use it, to share it with everybody in the meantime, which is super cool. And as you can probably tell from the number plate, it is the last one, the final, final, last Lotus Elise of that ever, which is really, really special. Next to it is my latest acquisition. And the Ferrari SF90 Stradale is a big car. It's a thousand horsepower. It's the most powerful car that I currently own. And what I think is really interesting is, as a person who really likes technology, being in the social media world, the camera world, the digital video world, that kind of thing, this obviously is the first series production, hybrid Ferrari. But it's also a V8 mid-engine Ferrari, and it was my first new Ferrari, and it was always a dream, obviously, as a child to one day buy a new Ferrari, and oh my gosh, how could that be possible? And I can't quite believe that it has become reality to do the spec myself, to actually pick it up in Maranello in Italy, uh, near the Ferrari factory. And here it is. Now, the interesting thing with the SF90 is when it was brand new, obviously you've got all the crazy hype. And I, I suppose like everyone else, I'm thinking, yeah, right, let's get in there, let's do it. And I actually went to spec up a car and then got to the stage of thinking, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is nearly half a million pounds for a presumably depreciating Ferrari. I can't possibly do this. So took a step back, but then I drove one. And when I drove one, I was kind of blown away by the performance, but blown away by how despite the fact it's a thousand horsepower it's actually still quite a fun car to drive quite enjoyable on the road so confirmed the order that i had put that in and it might have meant i've taken delivery effectively of one of the last sf90 stradales as opposed to the spiders but at the end of the day that's a car that i have specced as i like it for me blue with a light colored interior silver wheels epic thing absolutely crazy about it in every way and next to it is another car that i picked up fairly recently which by modern standards, obviously, is slightly dated, over a decade old, the Aston Martin DBS. This is a 2011 car, Bond car, a iconic car, one of the best looking cars ever, naturally has spirated Aston Martin V12. Very few of them in non-grayscale colors. Most of them are silver, gray, black, some white ones, not many in colors. So when I saw this up at McGurk Performance Cars, it's kind of instantly done. Like that's a car that I, dreamt of a lot back when I owned the next car we'll get to and always kind of aspired to. So being able to add one to my collection was you know, a really exciting thing for me. 
And I suppose that takes us back to a car that means an awful lot for me. A car that means so much, it's quite hard actually to concisely explain it. So back in 2010, I bought this very car. It was the early stages of me making videos online. I, well, things were going well at work and like any car nut with very few commitments in life, I overfinanced myself into an Aston Martin because that was my dream and somehow my man maths justified making that reality and it was this car. I did nearly 20,000 miles in it over the next two years. It was actually the first ever time I made a video talking to camera full stop was driving this car around central London, a bit of a review in it. So it's very important to me. It was the first, let's say, Schmimobile, as we call the cars now. It wore this number plate, which is obviously my birth year and my initials, and symmetrical, which I've always been a big fan of. I think it looks really nice when it was at auction. I had to go for that one. And then I sold it in 2012. And believe it or not, last year, 2021, the car found me. I'd been looking for it for a while, getting absolutely nowhere, but the current owner of it at the time took it to an event it said in the window previously owned by Tim Burton I'm slightly skeptical whether he knew which Tim Burton might have been the owner of the car but anyway somebody pointed that out to me we managed to make contact and um, he very kindly allowed me to buy it back so the emotional connection to this is really special even if it won't be driven much in the future because it's really where all of this began for me and filming videos obviously the collection of cars and it's still a lovely thing, you know, it's still a really lovely thing itself, which actually triggered the purchase of this about five and a half years ago, the Aston Martin Vantage GT8, one of 150 cars, spec'd it from new. And it was really a tribute I did at the time to the Vantage Roadster because it was you know, the final version of that generation of the Vantage with the 4.7 V8. And in cobalt blue was actually the launch color of the V8 Vantage S when that had come out. So that's why I chose that is my main body color with the golf inspired theme, as you can see. But obviously it was the dream at the time of having that car to upgrade it to a DBS. That didn't happen. They were out of my budget at the time, but nonetheless to keep the Aston Martin history, I suppose. And now I've got a trio of blue Aston Martins, but quite different. One auto, one semi-auto, one manual, two with the V8s, one with the V12. I think they make for a lovely little trio. Now we start the Black Series trio. Two of them, alas, are not here at the moment. The C63 was really, for me, kind of completing that trilogy. Um, the first I purchased was the SLS Black Series, which I repainted, did a whole lot with. In fact, in five months, I drove it 12,000 miles, which is slightly excessive, but had a lot of fun with, in the hope at the time, obviously, that a GT Black Series would arrive. Then I took delivery of the GT Black Series, repainted that as well into my own choice, which is a very complicated story. It's currently on its way back from the Middle East. I've had it out in Dubai, driving at the Dubai Autodrome, Yas Marina, up uh, Jebel Jace, and a whole load of other places out there, which has been truly out of this world, surreal to do. But I actually picked this up after the GT Black Series with the desire to build up that trio. I enjoy driving these cars so much. This engine is wonderful the lovely 6.2 litre, not 6.3 V8 that you find in the AMGs and the C63. I think prices were only going to go one way. So I decided to get in there while the uh, opportunity was still available. So that completes that like lineup, let's say for now. Another thing that I've always had a lot of fun with driving are the Focus RSs. Now back in 2016, um, confusingly with the Ford GT, Everybody thought that I just bought my first Focus RS to get the Ford GT, but it was actually because I wanted a Focus RS because I already had the Ford GT allocation. It didn't make sense at all the other way around. So I had the original nitrous blue car. I had a red edition, which we made into a bit of a project. And I was lucky to get the allocation for the Heritage, which is one of only 50 cars. They made it in this orange paintwork, the Tief orange, as effectively a tribute to the 1968 Escort Mark I, the spiritual ancestor, let's say, of the Focus. And this might be the last ever Focus RS, which means it's a really, again, quite special thing to have. And while cars like these are special, I'm not afraid of driving them. They all do miles, even this. It might not be a lot, but I think it's 6,000 or so, and it will do more because it's, you know, it's a very fun car to drive. I'll keep it, drive it, enjoy it. That's always the objective with these things. Up top, a car that won't get driven a whole lot at all. <laughs> a 1.2 litre, 2005 Renault Clio Dynamique. The story behind that, is actually that my first ever car was identical to this. We did actually manage to track down and you could technically argue that I own my first ever car. Unfortunately, it was involved in an accident. It was written off by its insurance company, obviously not with my ownership. I had it for the first three years of its life. 
um, and it became a lump of metal, a scrap metal cube, which I have, but hey, I can't really do all that much with it. But we did manage to track down an identical one, actually put on the number plate that I actually had back in 2005 on mine, which obviously I still own. So that's registered to the car. Just a bit of a fun tribute to it really. And beneath it is the AMG GTR Roadster. And like with the Black Series, big fan of the AMG GTs. I had a GTR, the Pro, the Roadster and the Black Series. This is one of 750 cars. I just really enjoy driving it. It's for a supercar with this level of performance, it's slightly more toned down, a little bit more understated. Still obviously stands out. It's a brutish AMG, but it's a car that you can drive daily and just get around with. And I've done a few things to personalize it, like put in the bucket seats, which you can't order in the Roadster. Um, opened up the exhaust valve, some small bits like that. So we've obviously got the lifts here. The Clio is the only one up top at the moment, but the Benpack auto stackers mean that I have the ability to add a few more cars down this side. So that's the plan for the future. Over here, the aforementioned SLS and GT Black series are missing. Um, we would normally also have the Senna. Now the Senna, unfortunately, decided to spring a little leak. So that's at the dealer at the moment. But even the Senna, which is now three and a half years old, I've had some amazing times out with it at the Nürburgring, a couple of track days at Spa. I think these cars are for driving and you know taking something like that to that kind of location is where it's at home and it's a completely different experience so that's you know here in the collection then the next car is an interesting one the 675 lt spider the other mclaren because i've actually owned this now for about six years and before we get kind of fully onto that something that's quite interesting about all of this is that in the youtube social media world if you were let's say trying to maximize the business side of it, you would probably just churn through cars and sell them. But to me, there's much more of a, both an emotional connection, but also the experiences and the desire to grow the car collection, which is why something like the 675 LT Spider, even six years on, is still here in my garage. This was actually the first time I ever made a completely bespoke specification, my own custom paint on the car. I've done 18,000 miles in it, which for one of these, I know over six years, but when you consider the collection for one of these is actually really quite a lot. There will be some out there that have done some more. But again, that's been all the way down to, I think I took it to Bosnia, Montenegro, Croatia, all the main more closer, let's say closer European countries, and just had some amazing memories with it over those years. And, you know, it might not get used all that much, but it's something very special, like the Senna and like the Ford GT. Now, the Ford GT, to me, is just the, it's the ultimate, I suppose, it's quite a strange one to word, but reward or trophy to myself for the fact that somehow all of this happened. It's kind of a, a really special thing, both what it represents as a car, but also what it means to me. Um, as a car, the Ford GT was introduced 50 years after the 1966 win at Le Mans. They went back to Le Mans. They won the GTE Pro class with the Ford GT. Um, and allocations for road cars were super hard to get a hold of. They did not exactly sell a whole lot of them. They were in very high demand, and rightfully so, because it is a wonderful thing to look at. The shapes, the design, everything about it. And then with my car, we chose the factory option of liquid red paint, but did the Allen Mann gold stripes to match the Allen Mann racing teams of the 1960s. And I always like to create a nod or some kind of story behind the car. And it's the same with the interior. We did some upgrades with the OEM suppliers for the car, with Sparco, with ADP, and basically made it a kind of one-off special, even the wheels um, as well. So some really nice touches. And again, the car has featured in plenty of videos. I've had a lot of fun with it. I took it to Silverstone, to Hockenheim. I took it all across the USA, to New York, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Las Vegas, Detroit, Chicago, you name it. And to look at the car and remember those stories is something that makes it very special for me as well. So even though it's three and a half years on, and even though it's probably going to be a warranty-free nightmare, shall we say, because I imagine there are gonna be a fair few things that are gonna be difficult to arrange, that's a car that, you know, now, if I was, not, let's say, really into it. Obviously, I would just sell it. It's worth a fortune um, more than I bought it for. So to me, it's much more about keeping it for those special occasions when I do take it out. But we do come to the next car, which is a little bit different, shall we say. Um, the Lamborghini Huracan STO. 
And the colour choices I went for on this have always been such a funny topic. I'm not going to lie, part of the reason for buying my first ever Lamborghini was because if you think of the internet, you think of views and clicks, you think of Lamborghini. Lamborghinis are the most outrageous flamboyant cars that exist. And the Hurricane STO is the prime example of that. Taking the Super Trofeo race car and incorporating bits of the aero onto a road car and it looks utterly silly. I chose to do this paint scheme, the Viola Bast, this magenta paintwork with the yellow accents, quite literally as a talking point, as a, if you're going to spec a Lamborghini to be outrageous, let's go as outrageous as we can. So that was how that kind of came together. And you know what? I've actually grown to it since, even just the debate it causes, even just the conversations that kick off around it. People will say they actually really like it when they see it. People will say they absolutely hate it. And to be honest, that's completely fine by me. It's doing the desired job almost as a result. So it's a lot of fun. And obviously with a V10, it sounds amazing. So what else isn't here at the moment? The Shelby GT500, the Mustang that's over in the US. I've had it for about a year and a half now, 10,000 miles or so when I'm over in the US, I spend a lot of time there. And also my former Formula One car is now it's having its restoration at the moment. So that should be back, I guess in a month or two when we've done a whole lot of things to make it look really nice and paint it up as a bit of a tribute to what it was. It's a show car. Um, as opposed to an actual car that raced. So it's a show car from 97, Williams FW19, um, which was the year of Jacques Villeneuve and Heinz Harald Frentzen. So it'll be done in the Rothmans livery and look really quite cool. So I think, you know, when it comes to the cars, obviously I have a bias towards track focused specials. I mean, you don't have to look very far, STO, GT, LT, for example, because that's what I really enjoy driving. I enjoy taking a car on a road trip, driving a long distance, doing some laps at Spa or the Nürburgring and continuing from there. So there's obviously a theme, but I also like variety. You know, there are some AMGs, some Fords, some Mercedes, Mercedes AMGs, obviously, some Ferraris, some Aston Martins. I've forgotten the GTC4 Lasso, which I've only had for about three months and done six and a half thousand miles with because it's a brilliant car to actually use. Super practical, super lovely, just super big on the fuel bills along the way. The fun thing then about all of the cars and especially with the Schmuseum channel is more of a come hang out with us here at the garage and what we're actually up to because you don't really think about it, but managing a collection of cars actually takes a significant amount of time and work. You know, at this very moment in time, the GT500 is at a service in Miami. The SLS is actually having some engine management work done, um, having some rebuilds effectively. The GT Black Series is in transport back. The Lusso is at a service. The F1 is being restored. The kind of list goes on. There's always something that needs to be done. And it's, I think, quite fun to be able to share more of that, the good and the bad, and what happens with these cars and you know what it's actually like looking after them, but also what goes on here in the garage, because the process behind all of this is kind of crazy. It started with no lighting. It wasn't even closed up, no shutters. We didn't even have a concrete floor. It was just dirt because it was literally a cow shed. This was a milking parlor prior to moving in. And to even have a mezzanine and upstairs area here now gives the most phenomenal view downstairs. I'd like to do more work with the construction for a lounge, for some kitchen and facilities areas over here, for some offices upstairs but it's very expensive. And it might sound strange to say that with all of the cars here, but construction is a bit of a different league to cars, oddly. All of this is kind of, yeah, lots of work to be done. And we're learning as we go as a team, which is really good fun as well. I think just to explore it and be able to share it and discover it as we go. So that, as they say, ladies and gentlemen, is that. I've had a fantastic day out with Tim. A huge thank you to him for inviting me out. This was all his idea. I hope you've been able to get a little bit out of the video and perhaps seen a side to him that I don't think the internet gets to see often enough. We are both, unfortunately, very busy people, which is why I'm now doing my outro in a car park, filming Alexis at eight o'clock. He is also editing, working, because that man is a machine. In any case, if you have enjoyed today's different style of video, please do tell me and I'll actually do some more because in some ways they're a lot easier to do, although I know I'm going to regret this come the edit. But if you've enjoyed it, it's all worth it in the end. So for now, thanks to Tim for inviting me out. Thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.